This is the last week of techniques of integration. In this week, I have three techniques to introduce. The first concern trigonometric integrals. For trig integrals, there isn't one universal approach like partial fractions for rational functions. Different trig integrals can be solved by different methods, including methods we've already covered like substitution and integration by parts. However, there are some strategies unique to trig integrals, and that's what this video will cover. To approach a trig integral, I suggest you try one of the four following approaches. I'll give the general ideas here, and I'll show use of all of these in the examples. Sometimes it's best to change everything into sine and cosine. All trig functions can be expressed as ratios of sine and cosine, so this is always possible. In the form of sines and cosines, sometimes there are useful cancellations, and sometimes a substitution becomes clear. Sometimes, instead of changing to sines and cosines, it is more helpful to eliminate denominators. If the integral only involves trig functions, this can always be done using the definitions. If there is a sign in the denominator, I can write it in the numerator as a cosecant, since cosecant is, by definition, 1 over sine, and likewise for other trig denominators. Also, the reference materials include many trig identities, squares identities, half angles, double angles, sums, and other and difference identities, and more. You should try to recognize when a trig integral might fit the form of one of these identities. They can often simplify a complicated integrand. They will be necessary for applying certain kinds of trig integrals throughout this week. Finally, I can make use of the periodic symmetry of trig integrals, at least for definite integrals. Let me first elaborate on this last one, the symmetry arguments. Consider the definite inter integral of sine from 0 to pi. This is one period of the sine function. Over its period, there is an equal area above and below the x-axis. Therefore, the definite integral must be zero, since these two areas will cancel out. Similarly, the sine function from negative pi to over two to pi over two has negative values below zero and positive values above zero, and it is otherwise perfectly symmetric, so these will also cancel out, and the sum of the area is again zero. This type of argument works for any odd multiples of a trig function as well. Sine to the seventh over a whole period is different from si the shape from sine, but it has the same symmetry properties. Note that this does not work for even powers, since an even power will always be positive and there will be no negatives to cancel. Finally, if the period is altered, then the symmetry argument must change as well. Sine 3x has a period of 2 pi over 3 instead of 2 pi. Therefore, the integral from 0 to 2 pi over 3 will be 0 by symmetry. These arguments are very helpful for many definite trig integrals. I'll always be on the lookout to use them to save myself some calculation. Now let me get into some examples to show some of the other techniques for trig integrals. Often I will try to find a substitution that works. If there is an expression entirely in cosine with one sine function left over, or vice versa, then a substitution will work. This integral has all cosines and then one sine, so u equals cos x with du equals negative sine x dx will work. All the cosines are replaced with u, and the sine x dx is replaced with negative du. I'll pull the negative out, split up the numerator, and do the two power rule integrals, which result in 1 over u plus u cubed over 3 plus c. Then I reverse the substitution. Here I choose to write 1 over cosine as secant in the answer. In this integral, there isn't a sine, a, an isolated sine or cosine, so I can't immediately use the substitution. However, even powers of cosine can be changed into sine using a trig identity. Let me work this out with cos to the fifth and show you how it works. First, I separate this out, uh, out as cos to the four times cos. I want one cosine to be left over to make the substitution work well. Then I'll write cos to the four as cos squared squared, this is a valid application to the rules of exponents. Then I can use a trig identity. Since sine squared plus cos squared is 1, I can replace cos squared with 1 minus sine squared. In this way, I have removed all but one power of cosine from the integral. This was possible because I started with an odd power of cosine. Now I get back to the integral. With only one cosine remaining, a substitution u equals sine x with du equals cos x dx works very well. I replace all the sine terms with u and, all the, and the cos x dx with du. And the result is a polynomial integral, which I know how to do. I expand the binomial and multiply in the u squared 
and then integrate each of the three pieces using linearity, adding the constant of integration, of course. At the end, I reverse the substitution to get the final antiderivative. Here is another example with sines and cosines, this time a definite integral. In the previous two examples, there was an odd power of sine or cosine. Odd powers of sine or cosine allow a substitution to work, but if I have two even powers, that setup will not work. I need a different approach. Another set of trig identities that are useful here are the half angle identities. These are particularly useful for even powers since they reduce the exponents in exchange for changing the period by putting a 2t inside the function. These identities say that sine squared is 1 minus cos 2t over 2, and cos squared is 1 plus cos 2t over 2. I can make these replacements. In this, I again treat cos to the 4 as cos squared squared. Well, then I get this integral. The denominator here is 8, and I multiply out this binomial. And then I multiply the two terms in the numerator and split them up into four integrals using linearity. Using the double angle or the half angle identity, I was able to turn this strange product with even exponents into four different doable integrals. The first integral is just the integral of a constant, which is the difference of the endpoints. The second and fourth integrals are integrals over a whole period. The 2t makes the period 0 to pi instead of 0 to 2 pi. Since they are odd powers, 1 and 3, they are both 0 by symmetry, and I told you that the symmetry would help. It eliminates two of the four integrals without any further calculation at all. For the third integral, I don't have a direct approach for cosine squared. However, I can use the same half angle again. Cosine squared is 1 plus cos 2t over t, but since the original is 2t, the new term inside the cosine is going to be 4t. Then I can split this integral up into two, both of which are just basic integrals, one of a constant and one just of a cosine. I finish those two integrals, then I put it all together to get pi over 16. Here is one more example to show some more of the techniques. This is expressed in tangents and secants. I could change this all into sines and cosines. However, everything is in the numerator and there are no denominators. And some of, of products of these kinds are approachable when everything is in the numerator. Here, I'm going to do something similar to what I've been doing with the sines and cosines. Since the derivative of tangent is secant squared, if I can isolate a secant squared, then the tangent substitution will likely work. Well, I split up secant to the 4 into two secant square terms multiplied by each other. One I can leave alone for the substitution, and one I can change into 1 plus tan squared using the trig identity for tan squared and secant squared. Then everything is tangent except for the secant squared, so I use the tangent substitution. u equals tan x, and du equals secant squared x dx. There are bounds here, so I also change the bounds. When x is 0, u is tangent of 0, which is also 0. And when x is pi over 3, u is tangent of pi over 3, which is root 3. Then I replace all the pieces to get this integral. I multiply the polynomial out, and I split the integral up using linearity. I calculate both of the integrals and evaluate on the bounds. After simplifying all these resulting fractions, I get 117 over 8 as the area under the curve. Here is that same example once more. I want to show you that in some cases, two different methods can both work. Instead of using the tangent substitution, I could also change everything into sines and cosines. Tangent is sine over cosine and secant is 1 over cosine. So changing everything to sines and cosines gives sine to the 5 over cosine to the 9. There's an odd power of sine here, which means a cosine substitution will work. So I pull out sine to the 4, leaving one sine left over. I change sine to the 4 into, the sine, into sine squared squared, which is 1 minus cos squared squared. Then I can use the cosine substitution. There are bounds here, so I also change the bounds using the cosine. And the result is this integral, which is a rational function integral. I expand the binomial in the numerator to get these three terms. Then I split up the numerator into three pieces, and the integral into three integrals by linearity. The rest of the slide is these three integrals, evaluated on the bounds, and then quite a lot of arithmetic with those bounds. Notice that all this arithmetic is completely different from the arithmetic using the first technique, but the end result still is the same, 117 over 8.